Hello and welcome to another episode of the Tennessee Informer. I'm your host, Dave Vance. Before we bring on our very special guest tonight, I want to take a moment to thank InfoWars and Alex Jones for posting an article on their website about an interview that we did a few weeks ago with FBI whistleblower Steve Friend. We don't know how they became aware of the inter interview, but do appreciate the call out and recognition. If you missed the episode with Steve Friend, you can find the full interview on our YouTube or Rumble channels. Tonight, our special guest is James Ron Kennedy. Uh, he and his brother wrote the book, The South Was Right, originally in 1991. It was revised again in 94, and recently it's been revised for the 21st century. A lot's going on in the last couple of decades. Uh, he, like his brother, are born, born and raised in Mississippi. Both attended uh, the University of Louisiana Monroe, and I'm going to have to let you know up front, we had some issues uh, due to weather with Donnie, who was originally going to be on with us. And so I don't have all of Ronnie's information. So I'm just going to let him do a little, uh, fill us in a little on the bio. Uh, but understand he's under a, in a, an area with a tornado watch as well. So if we lose connection, that's what's going on. But he's, he's live with us right now from Louisiana. And so, uh, Ronnie, if you just kind of fill in your bio information a little bit, and I apologize for not having it. Oh, that's quite all right. Uh, it's very boring. Uh, you know, I did my bachelor's degree in uh, University of Louisiana in Monroe, Louisiana. Did a uh, one of my master's degrees from Tulane University in New Orleans, a master's in healthcare administration, and a second master's from the University of uh, Loyola in uh, Chicago, uh, a master's in jurisprudence and healthcare law. Uh, and my expertise professionally has been in health care and uh, health care insurance, uh, particularly dealing with uh, regulations, rules, regulations, and medical malpractice. Wow. Well, that's that's a lot of stuff to know. That's, that's a very, uh, you, you can go down a lot of rabbit holes with any of those, I imagine. Yes, you can. And uh, the interesting thing is that nothing that either my brother or myself did as far as our education, other than the core curriculum education, nothing was directed toward history, uh, towards political science. Uh, that's always been a hobby of ours. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, we learned a long time ago that uh, being a history teacher might not be the best way to uh, accumulate wealth enough to be uh, secure <laughs> in your retirement and old age. So uh, we both went, he went into nursing anesthesia and I went into health care, particularly as it deals with the insurance. So, but our education on history has been self-taught. Uh, and studying and, and learning under many, many fine PhDs, uh, many who are now uh, crossed over the river and resting in the shade of the trees. Uh, but I'm honored to say that I, I have been uh, tutored by some of the finest historians living and now uh, passed on. Well, I, I can tell you that I have read most of this book that you and your brother wrote. I uh, haven't read all of it, but I read most of it. Very interesting book. A lot of things uh, I learned that I didn't know. Some things that I did know, some things I was reminded of. But I want to get right into it. Uh, and be, um, if I have a little bit of trouble, here we go. Okay. All right. It exposes this book, what it really does, in my opinion, is it, ex it exposes inconsistencies of the widely accepted narrative that ending slavery was the sole or main reason for the conflict, and that Lincoln and the North were the virtuous crusaders for freedom and preserving the Union, and the South and all Southerners were fighting for the preservation of slavery, and they were just basically barbaric people. Uh, that narrative leaves out a lot of facts and content. Uh, you care to hit on that a little bit? Uh, of course. You know, you all may, always must remember that the victor writes and enforces history. Uh, you know, imagine if uh, Germany had won World War II. Do you think the history of uh, the Battle of Britain would be taught today the same as it, uh, as it is had Germany won? No, the victor always writes. Now, if the victor is the aggressor, he has to write an emotional appeal to cover up many sins that he uh, uh, does in his effort to maintain his empire. And that's what that war was basically about. 
uh, but you take an emotional issue like slavery and that becomes the smoke screen that sort of they can hide many sins behind the smoke screen of we fought to free the slaves well all you have to do is look at history and you can see that that was not the purpose of the war uh interesting the first Yes, uh, the first uh, piece of legislation, uh, two of the uh, legislation passed by the United States Congress after the South had withdrawn. So there wasn't any conservative constitutionalist states' rights Southerners in Congress. They passed the Morial uh, Tariff, which increased the tariff beyond anything it had ever been. And they also submitted to the states the Corbin Amendment, which if the South would come back and pay the tariffs in the southern ports, allow the Union to collect those tariffs, and uh, they could keep their slaves forever. That was the original 13th Amendment. And Lincoln approved it, uh, Congress passed it, and several northern states uh, uh, also uh, ratified that uh, amendment or passed that amendment. But it failed when they found out that, wait, these Southerners aren't coming back. <laughs> it's not slavery that they're after. It's freedom. It's the right to govern ourselves in a manner that's best for all of our people. Uh, but remember, it's the emotional appeal of slavery that the Union used not only to rally their people, but to act as a smokescreen behind which they could hide their imperialistic efforts to maintain their control over their what amounted to their cash cow. Uh, people might not know what cash cow is nowadays, but the South became the ATM, the automatic teller machine for the uh, North because all, all the tariffs that was being collected uh, in southern ports, 80% of that money went to the north. It didn't come to the south. The south was being exploited, financially exploited. And that's why the south pulled away and said, we, that's one of the main reasons that the south pulled away. Okay. Now, a couple of things on that. And to, to your last point there, I mean, South Carolina and specifically almost pulled away over that issue 30 years prior during right. the first nullification crisis over the tariff. Um, and so I'm sure that if had they pulled out, I'm sure they wouldn't have been the only one at the time to have pulled out. Um, no, I, because several southern states had already said we'll send troops to help defend South Carolina. Uh, back in uh, was 1830, uh, 38, about, I forget the exact yeah. date. Yeah. And now, I do want to ask you one thing, though, in reference to, uh, the, I, I, I do know that the, the Confederate Constitution is very similar to the U.S. Constitution. Uh, it, it does mention slavery in it, whereas the U.S. doesn't, but it alludes to it. Um, and so I guess there will be some that will say, well, it was in your constitutions and some of your states, especially your, uh, the deep southern states, did mention slavery as the reason for secession. Although I don't see a reason for secession uh, is equaling the reason for the war, uh, personally. But just what, what are your thoughts on that? Right. Well, for, first of all, uh, let's get the constitutions. Uh, the United States Constitution specifically protected slavery, the slave trade and slavery. Uh, so the, first of all, they protected the slave trade. Even when Thomas Jefferson and the, uh, many of the southern colonies wanted to stop this trade, slave trade, uh, their efforts were nullified by Great Britain. Uh, and then later at the Constitutional Convention, they were nullified by the northern uh, states or then states that were actively engaged in the slave commerce. So they didn't want to lose that slave commerce because they had a good thing going. Now, the con so that was kept in the Constitution until about uh, 1808 uh, before it was finally terminated. Then, on, and on top of that, there was a fugitive slave section of the Constitution. That was in the U.S. Constitution. And that Fugitive Slave Act, that part of the Constitution was mirrored after the original Fugitive Slave Act law. The original fugitive slave law belonged to the United Colonies of New England back in the 1600s, and Massachusetts was the leader of that. So the, the original 
fugitive slave uh, law was merely something that the New Englanders had and, and was put back into the U.S. Constitution. Uh, so the, the fact that this is the United States Constitution. Now you go to the Confederate Constitution and you'll see that, number one, it prohibits the slave trade. Right. First of all, no slaves will be allowed into the, the Confederate States of America. That was in the Constitution. All the Confederate states agreed to it. As a matter of fact, Jefferson Davis's first veto was against a piece of legislation that went through Confederate Congress that said, hey, these slaves that we capture from the Yankees, I'll believe it or not, Yankees had slaves during oh, yeah. the war. So he said, these slaves that we capture from the Yankees, let's sell them and and put the money into the treasury so we can use the money to, to uh, pay for defense. And Jefferson Davis said no. He vetoed that because it, it violates the spirit of the Constitution, the Confederate Constitution, that prohibited the importation of slaves. So that's the Confederate Constitution. Now, the Confederate Constitution left to the states to decide how they will get rid of slavery. And that's a great problem. And Don and I point this out in uh, uh, Jefferson Davis' High Road to Emancipation, which is another one of our books that we wrote and came out recently. But we point out the fact that the South was determined to get rid of slavery peacefully and in a manner that would allow for the society not to be disrupted and both black and whites could live together. That was the high road of uh, emancipation that Jefferson Davis advocated in Congress. Uh, and it was something that the South was trying to do to get rid of slavery. But it was the function of the states. The state of Tennessee, for instance, was well, by 1830, had, had many, many, many freed slaves. So they weren't slaves. They were free people of color in their state. Uh, uh, Virginia also, Virginia came within a couple of votes of getting rid of slavery uh, in their state. The problem was the radical abolitionists moved in and gnawed the effort of the South to have peaceful emancipation uh, because they were trying to organize slave revolts, much like what happened in Haiti. And God knows <laughs> Haiti is still in having trouble, and that's one of them. Because in the slave revolt in Haiti, they killed not only the slave owners, not only the men, not only the adults, but the women and the children and the infant, but not just slave owners, any white person that they could lay their hands on, they killed them. That was what was great fear, and that's why the Deep South, like Mississippi, put slavery in there as a, one of the reasons why they're wanting to secede was because Mississippi had about 50% of its population uh, black, and they didn't want a situation where they're going to have a, a Haitian-style slave revolt. Uh, as a governor, Brandon of Mississippi in 1830 even said that slavery is an, a terrible institution. It's an evil institution. We must find a way to get rid of it. He was part of that Southern effort to walk down, travel down that high road to emancipation where you could have peaceful emancipation and bring the, educate the people, educate the slaves and bring them into civil society. Uh, but that was not across by the Yankees, the abolitionists, the New England radical abolitionists who were promoting slave uprising. And Lincoln bought into that with his Emancipation Proclamation. That was one of his efforts, hopes, was that it would stir up a slave revolt uh, in which the white boys in the army, Confederate Army, would rush back home to protect their women and children. Well, it didn't happen. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons it didn't happen, but uh, we can go into that uh, at another time. Couple, couple things here. Number one, you mentioned uh, the about catching, capturing slaves that belong to Union officers, which I'm sure there's a lot of people that didn't know about that. I want to hit that in a second. Uh, but back to the Constitution now. If I recall correctly, 
it was a combination of the northern states like Massachusetts and the deep south, uh, South Carolina and Georgia probably in particular, that d really didn't want to end slavery uh, during the time the Constitution was created. But what I'm saying is it was both upper north and deep south. It wasn't just the south. There was the, you, yeah. you, you had the commercial interest, the ones who right. brought most of the slaves over here, they were adamant as well that, no, we're not going to take this up. Because I think Franklin and some others were the ones that were pushing the issue during the convention. Well, uh, Georgia, and, no, let's see, Georgia and South Carolina did not want to end the slave trade because they were expanding their agriculture. But the other southern states said, no, we don't want to anymore and so they were the ones opposed to uh continue or given a i think it was 20 years extension of the slave trade right. but uh, it was it was all of the north you know th th they hold themselves up as new england oh we're so so honorable that that we were willing to do anything to get rid of slavery they were willing to do anything to keep slavery because it was very profitable for them not only in the slave trade, what most people don't realize, but New York financial interests, they got they were making a lot of money on lending back and forth to these big plantations that had many, many, many slaves and, and was making great profits off the cotton trade. And uh, uh, also uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, oh, the the uh, commercial interests of the North who uh, they were mill rights that they were making uh, fibers and they needed the cotton to uh, from the south in order to uh, make their cotton their 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 fabrics. Uh, one person uh, said that the loom master was as bad as the uh, whip master, the slave master, uh, in in the continuation of slavery. Uh, so and that's it's it's not a black and white north versus south. It's a Commercial interests, as you pointed yeah. out, on both parties, but the vast majority of the Southerners were plain folk of the Old South. They didn't have big plantations. The big plantation houses, uh, you see, those are rare compared to the cabins and the small farmers, many of who uh, we call them the plain folk of the Old South. They made their money not by intensive agriculture, but by herd herding uh, cattle and hogs. The, the value of the cattle and the hogs in 1860 was equal to the value, or even more than the value of the cotton, tobacco, uh, indigo, which was pretty well gone by 1860, and uh, uh, sugar cane. So, you know, the, the, the plain folk of the South, who made up about 80% of the military in the Confederate Army, they had no direct connection with the plantation system. Right. And of course, you know, you mentioned, we mentioned the shipping industry. You know, the, the ships were built in the north. The ships from the north went to Africa, picked up the slaves, and, you know, eventually brought them back. Well, when they went over there, they bought the slaves from other black tribes. That's where they bought them from. Okay. We're not talking about a bunch of scurvy ridden white guys getting off in Africa somewhere and chasing down a bunch of black people in the jungle for the most part. We're talking about them buying slaves from other blacks, bringing them back here, and then most of them were in the South, though not all of them, especially, you know, as time went on, it became more of a Southern uh, deal to have slaves, but the North had them too. At the time of our Constitution, every state had slaves. Right. And most people don't realize that... Uh the uh, slave system of slavery lasted 75 years longer in New York, right. or no, Massachusetts, than it did in Mississippi. And it lasted longer in New York than it did in Alabama. Uh, so, it, you know, slavery is something that was endemic to all of the colonies, but it wasn't unique to the United States. Slavery no. has been around since man picked up a stone axe and went after the, the neighboring tribe. Yeah. Uh, and, and you're so correct. When the Yankees, New Englanders, went over to the Ivory Coast to get the, the slaves, they didn't go into the jungle. Why? Because they 
it wasn't until the advanced medicine that white people could survive. We, as a people, did not have the natural immunity to the diseases of the tropics, and we would die off. So we didn't go in there. It was the their fellow Africans that captured, and of course, slavery was a big part of, of Africa from the, from the very beginning. Uh, but what most people don't realize is that Due to the uh, the Muslim conquest and the Barbary pirates, yeah. there were more white slaves than there uh, in 1860 or really 1830s than there was uh, black slaves in America. Those slaves were taken over to the Barbary coast and and made slaves to the uh, Muslims. And let me tell you something: pick, I picked cotton, okay, in Mississippi in in the late August. And let me tell you, that ain't fun. <laughs> I've done it, but it beats the heck out of being chained to a boat where you got to row it and you can't leave. You stay there until you die. You're exposed to the sun. The death rate was horrid, horrendous, and these were not black people. These were the whites. Uh, it got so bad that many of the fishermen in Great Britain refused to go out uh, into the ocean to fish because of fear of the Barbary pirates coming in and the other Muslim pirates coming in and kidnapping the, the fishermen and selling them as slaves. Yeah. So slavery is, is not unique to the United States, nor is it unique to any one race. I think yeah. Thomas Sowell uh, made the point that it, it wasn't so much a racial thing. It was just who did you have close by? And at that time, uh, you know, you had your neighboring tribe, your neighboring uh, nation. You could conquer them and turn them into slaves. Uh, it wasn't until probably the Industrial Revolution that uh, it really got profitable. Or just prior to the Industrial Revolution, it became profitable to take ships over to Africa and capture the slaves. And even then, we didn't do uh, the the that slave trade was minute compared to the uh, Islamic slave trade. But, you know, we could talk about slavery all the way, but yeah. it's an emotional issue. Yeah. I mean, who wants to be a slave, you know? Yeah. And, <laughs> I, and, and this is not, you know, we're not, certainly not advocating it. We, this is not, we're not trying to downplay it. It existed. It was terrible. We're glad it's over. But it's just the, the fact that the way things have been presented is, has not been accurate in terms of uh, the Civil War and, and the things related to that. So, uh, you know, there were a lot of compromises over slavery beginning in 18, 1820 as our country expanded to the West. And then in the 1850s, it really took a turn for the worse. Let's talk about that a little bit. Well, uh, I have a book coming up on Reconstruction. I talk about uh, one of the major strategic uh, uh, failures of the South uh, made uh, which led to Reconstruction, really uh, happened in, in the 1850s. And, and there was a lot going on in the 1850s. Of course, we, we were uh, expanding as a nation. Uh, cotton was, was really king as far as commerce was concerned, as uh, international commerce in, in the South. So that made the uh, large plantation owners, who were mainly weren't Democrats, they were Whigs, they, 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 they believed in... Uh, in maintaining a mercantilist type of, of economy. But uh, one of the problems that the South really fell into was when they had their Nashville Convention uh, in the 1950s, I'm sorry, 1850s. And uh, that was all about, they made it all about slavery uh, because they saw slavery as the tool that the North was using to hem in the South. You know, when they said you can't send your, you can't take your slaves into the Western territories, so what they were saying is you can't have additional Southern states, but we will have additional Northern states. So politically, we will totally dominate the South. Well, you know, since the South was already paying 80% of the revenue to finance the federal government, uh, it became obvious that something had to be done, uh, but the people at the Nashville Convention made it about slavery. Well, again, slavery is 
an emotional issue back then. They sort of fed into the abolitionists, the radical abolitionists, uh, who claimed that the South was trying to turn uh, the, the, the whole nation into a slave uh, nation, which never was. We were in the effort of trying to get rid of slavery gradually. Uh, but what they should have done, and I do this, talk about this in my upcoming book on Reconstruction, is they should have made it uh, not about slavery itself, but about giving the South time necessary to travel the high road to emancipation. This would have at least taken the emotional issue away from the radical abolitionists, and it would also given position the South internationally to be able to say, we are in the effort of, of getting rid of slavery. Great Britain recognized us so we can be independent and take care of this problem of slavery. Uh, so it was a strategic debacle of the National Convention. Uh, a lot of people think it was a strategic, uh, a tactical victory, but it, it was a strategic debacle. Well, who were the people responsible for that in, uh, in the uh, convention? Was that, was it mostly uh, Whigs at that convention? It, it, the, the people, and I hate to, I hate to say this because one of my favorite Southern characters is President Jefferson Davis, but he was there. Every Southern state, I believe one Southern state was a representative, uh, but they all were, most if not all, were represented. And they looked at it strictly as we're being hemmed in because we can't take our slaves into new territories and create Southern states to keep a balance. And remember, that was one of the compromises made at the Constitutional Convention, is we'll have this balance so that one section can't dominate the other section. The commercial won't uh, dominate the agriculture. The North won't dominate the South. There'll be give and play between, but we'll keep we'll keep the states relatively equal. Well, that point was violated. As a matter of fact, when Louisiana was petitioning to come into the Union, Massachusetts declared, as I believe it was uh, 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 Quincy, I can't, Josiah Quincy, I believe was his name, representative from uh, Massachusetts, swore that if Louisiana is allowed to come into the Union, Massachusetts would secede from the Union. Matter of fact, I love this. He said, uh, Massachusetts will not uh, remain in a union with the mixed race Creoles of Louisiana. Yeah. <laughs> he, he didn't have much much uh, tolerance for, for the Louisiana Creoles. You know, now, they again, but their objection was bringing in new states that would offset the dominance that the North had. They said that Massachusetts said the same thing when Texas was petitioning for entry into the Union, and that that, that if Texas is brought into the Union, it's you know, the, Massachusetts would secede from the Union. So secession has been around quite often. Secession and nullification really has been bannered around by the Northern elements more than it has been, or at least as much, as the South. Right. Well, well now, another thing, too, back to... Uh, the Constitutional Convention, the, the Three-Fifths Clause, which is always yeah. distorted. It had nothing to do with this idea of, oh, that, that, that blacks counted for three-fifths of a man. What it was was the, the northern states during the convention, they didn't think slaves who couldn't vote, who weren't citizens, they didn't think that they should get full representation. So the compromise on that was, okay, we're not going to let you count every slave, because states like South Carolina even then had a, a huge slave population and not so much a, a huge white population. And so three-fifths was the compromise. It was, it was because they didn't want uh, the South to be able to count all their slaves since all of them weren't citizens. That's the way I've always understood that. It's very interesting when you look at the history of that three-fifths compromise because under the Articles of Confederation, now which pre that was the Constitution that preceded the, the current, const well, the Constitution of, uh, of 1787, right. uh, the art under the Articles of Confederation, states would be uh, taxed per capita, so depending on how what your population was. Well, at that point, the South didn't want slaves counted because that means they're, they're 
taxation would be higher. And so that's where the original three-fifths came, uh, compromise came from. Now, now go to the Constitution. Now it's the North that didn't want every slave to be counted because that would give the South more representation in the House of Representatives. Didn't matter about Senate because every state gets two state, uh, two senators, but it really made a difference in the House of Representatives. That's where all the finances originates. That's right. where the taxing policy originates. Yeah. So that's why they, it was the North that, that said, oh, you can only count three fifths uh, uh, of them. Now, very interesting. This, it really, came back again during Reconstruction because after the war, before Reconstruction began, it was obvious that the South would now, because now the 13th Amendment, blacks are free blacks and former slaves. They're all recognized as citizens and they're all counted and it'd be proportional representation. The South, now the North had fought a war to destroy the South and to, to destroy the political power, if not actually exterminate the South. They had fought a bloody war so they could control the federal government and use it for their benefit. But now all of a sudden, because of that war, the South's gonna have between 11 and 15 more <laughs> representatives in Congress. Oh my God, what have I done? Yeah. That's where they went into uh, the divide and rule where they really instituted, um, by divide, they wanted to divide the white and black South into war and faction, which is something empires always do when they conquer people. They'll select one group and side with that and make them opposed to the other group. I mean, the English did it in India with the Muslims and the Hindus. They did it in Scotland with the Scottish clans of different clans. They'd side with one and fight the other. That makes it cheaper to control your newly conquered territory. And it's a well-recognized uh, political idea, divide and rule. Well, that's what they instituted, and they instituted in order to create racial antagonism between the white and black Southerners, so we would view each other as enemies, not as not as neighbors, which is really what we were and are and still are today. You know, neighbors, not enemies. Right. Another thing, uh, going back to the expansion, you know, we hear the term free soilers, and we hear that okay, the North didn't want, you know, to have slave states added, but a lot of that was not necessarily just opposition to slavery. Part of that was they didn't want, you know, to compete with the with slave labor, which is understandable. Uh, but also, some of them really just did not want blacks. Period. In those states, they didn't want free blacks. They didn't want slaves. They wanted a lot of those states to be just for whites. And a, a lot of those states had huge bonds. If somebody, if a, a free black from the South wanted to go into certain states, like I think Ohio, Indiana, Illinois the yep. bond they would have to pay most white people could not pay at the time. Right, right. And, and that's that's the point. Even uh, Lincoln uh, and his address uh, uh, in Illinois, I believe it was uh, during the Stephen Douglas debates, but he wanted to guarantee that the new Western territories that they were taken away from the Plains Indians. Now, that's another story of genocide. But Lincoln said, hey, once we get all of this free territory, it's going to be reserved for free white people. That's President Lincoln said, "Your pre that, that's their president, not our president. He was never president in Louisiana, while well, Louisiana, <laughs> but uh, and he was dead after we were drugged back into the Union and we left before he was inaugurated in the United States. But that, the words of the man that the liberals love to honor, no, he was going to make sure that all these new states were reserved for free white people. Right. Uh, that, that, is so, that is so opposite of the attitude of Southerners. And, and as a matter of fact, one of the reasons that the Northerners, especially the New Englanders, despised Southerners so much was because we had been tainted, according to them, we had been tainted with this close relation with Africans. It's almost like uh, one, during the antebellum period, a, a Northern woman was shocked that a white 
mother would allow a black lady to hold her baby. I mean, it was just, it was beyond their comprehension. Their racial animosity is just, and of course, the draft riots in New York proved it. I mean, you look at the, there was far more lynchings and murders done in the South, uh, in the North uh, during the draft riots than it was in the South during Reconstruction. But you don't hear that story told. Right. So why did Lincoln's election cause the reaction in the South that it did? Well, you have to remember, the Republican Party was a sectional party. Uh, it was a party of the North. Uh, and recently, God, uh, so many of the neo-Marxist, not neo, uh, neo-con uh, talking heads on Fox and, and other conservative groups, uh, they were talking about uh, Trump being thrown off the ballot in uh, Colorado, and they said that's just like the way Lincoln was thrown off the ballot in the South. Well, they're idiots. Lincoln was never on the ballot in the South. There was not a Republican Party in the South, and the South knew that the uh, Republican Party was a sectional party dedicated to the destruction of the South. Uh, if not destruction, it's certainly uh, the 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 use of the South as a cash cow that they could then exploit. Right. Uh, and of course, after the war, they turned us into their economic and political colony. Is the term Civil War even an accurate description of the war? I mean, the South was trying for independence. It was not trying to take over the North. Yeah, it'd be like calling uh, the Revolutionary War in 1776 as a Civil War. Uh, you know, Proper definition, you know, words mean nothing in, in woke society, you know, uh, <laughs> but, but the proper definition of a civil war, and you know this as a military uh, historian, is when there's two different groups fighting for the domination of the same government. Uh, the English Civil War is an example. The, uh, the white Russians against the Bolsheviks, it was a uh, Russian Civil War. Uh, two groups trying to maintain or, or get control of the government. The South left, pulled out, left, and, and said simply, as Jefferson Davis, President Davis said, all we ask is to be left alone. Uh, and that's all the South has ever asked, to be left alone so we can solve our problems and our issues. The South was not heaven on earth. We had problems, uh, but we knew how to solve them. We were traveling the, or attempting to travel the high road to emancipation. We were attempting to, and Jefferson Davis is a great example of this. Every one of his plantations had schools where the uh, black children would taught how to read and write and all of them were skilled as one of it and i quote this in the jefferson davis book uh one of his slaves after the war made the comment and this is uh was recorded and it's in the library of congress if you can dig it out again where they actually recorded him where the jefferson davis former slave said that when we got free we had been educated, we had been given uh, skills, and we could take care of ourselves. That's a, that's a far, far different way in which Lincoln and the uh, Yankee government uh, did to the majority of the South, uh, slaves in the South during the war and after the war. Now, secession, was that's not just an idea that was accepted in the South. I mean, the American Revolution was essentially secession, wasn't it? Well, of course. I mean, yeah, and the, the greatest uh, secession document ever written, and, and the people in the Netherlands would, would uh, argue with me there, but because uh, uh, when they seceded from Spain, they, they had a document that was very similar to the uh, Declaration of Independence, and some of them claimed that Thomas Jefferson <laughs> read it and sort of patterned the, the Declaration of Independence. And this scholarship pointing to that, but hey, you know, no, we're not original thinkers here. We're, we're taking <laughs> good ideas. But in the Declaration of Independence, it, it, it plainly says that, first of all, liberty rights come from God, not from government. Okay. Right. So that's why they're unalienable. Now, now, a tyrant can suppress rights, but it, he can't destroy the rights. The right remain. When Hitler took over France, 
the French people still had the right to be free, but they dare not do anything about it except for the resistance that did a lot about it. Right. But that doesn't destroy, you know, occupying a people does not destroy the right to be free. So, first of all, rights come from God, and we have an inalienable right to live under a government based upon the consent of the governed. Now, the southern states pulled out and said, we no longer give our consent to that government. That government is now harmful to us. And the Declaration of Independence plainly says when a government becomes, and I'm paraphrasing, but so when a government becomes uh, a, a supr a oppressive of the rights of the people, the people have the right and duty to establish new government that will more likely protect their rights, their God-given rights. So, yeah, the Declaration of Independence, every 4th of July is a celebration of secession. Uh, but then again, when we went into the Articles of Confederation, do you know that there's like six or seven places in the Articles of Confederation, remember that was the Constitution prior, prior to the Constitution. In the Articles Conservative, there are about seven different places in which it said this is a permanent union. So it's permanent. It's going to last forever. Well, that's an absurd thing. Uh, no country lasts forever. Yeah, it's just, but that's what it says. But they found out that, you know, there's some problems with this Articles Confederation. We need to change it. So every state withdrew. They seceded from the Articles of Confederation, yep. and then they acceded on their own volition now. They acceded to the Constitution, the Union formed under the Constitution. Yep. Uh, so, so, you know, there's two cases where the, the, the United States practiced secession. But, but look at uh, when uh, Texas seceded from Mexico. The United States gave its stamp of approval by first recognizing Texas as a sovereign nation. It had seceded. Now, look, embarrassed or not, that territory belonged to Mexico by all rights. But the government was not functioning to a manner that's, that, that, uh, that the people of Texas wanted. And, and they had gone down to Mexico to try to, to negotiate a better deal, more like a dominion status with Mexico, but they were thrown in jail by, uh, by the Mexican authorities. So they came back and said, you know, we just got to leave. So they pulled out. They seceded. They fought a war of independence. And it wasn't a civil war. It was a war of independence. And Texas became a free, independent, and sovereign nation. So, and the United States recognized that. So we recognized secession uh, as a nation. And then we doubled down when we allowed that seceded nation to come into a seed into the Union. So uh, there's many, many, many times, and I've already noted twice when Massachusetts threatened to secede. And there was a number of other times that, that secession, and it was a given fact. Uh, no one doubted that until Lincoln. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Every president recognized that the Constitution created a league of sovereign states, and the states came into the Union specifically as free, sovereign, and independent states. And they delegated, they didn't surrender, they right. delegated certain authority to their agent, their agent, the federal government. The federal government is a creature of the states. The states did not were not created by the federal government. But Lincoln said they, they did. He turned it upside down in his first inauguration that the states that the Union created the states. That's absurd. Well, especially like you said, you know, we had the Articles of Confederation. And initially the Articles of Confederation, you had to if you're going to change something in the Constitution, it took all thirteen to agree. Well, the Constitution only needed nine to put it into effect. And of course, we ended up with 13, not all at once. For a while, you know, North Carolina, I don't think they approved it till like 1790 in Rhode Island, or Rogue Island as it was known, uh, yeah. sometime later in 1790. But theoretically, any of those states that didn't join after the nine, they would have remained independent nations. With, they were. Yeah, so that's... <laughs> You know, that's something that Americans don't understand. We throw the term states around as if it were synonymous with province. 
a state, uh, well, for instance, in the Treaty of Paris that recognized the, uh, end of, where the Great Britain recognized the independence of the 13 colonies, each state is mentioned. They're granted or not granted. They are acknowledged to be free, independent, sovereign states. Right. State being in the same thing as nation. A state is the same thing as a nation. Now, you say, oh, no, 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 that's not right. Well, guess what? Great Britain in that same document is known as, is uh, titled the State of Great Britain. So you mean Great Britain was a province? Hell no. It was a <laughs> sovereign nation, just like the 13 colonies were each sovereign nation. And they came in and together to form a league of sovereign nations or states, sovereign states. That's why the term states' rights means something. It's very important if you're going to maintain a constitution. Now, the, uh, the, the, the people in the North didn't want to maintain that constitution. Uh, they wanted to melt it down and have a consolidated uh, government that could rule, you know, sort of like we're being ruled today. Right, right. Yeah, we have the government that the uh, founders uh, feared, and we, had, we have the government that the reason... That is the reason the Bill of Rights were created. Of course, you know, Bill of Rights are just written down. You know, paper does not enforce itself. Uh, so let's move a little bit ahead. Talk about the situation leading up to Fort Sumter and the different approaches between Buchanan, President Buchanan and Lincoln. Yeah, President Buchanan, uh, he was essentially, the, he followed the same pattern that, that the presidents before him had followed in the fact that the states were sovereign, they were uh, independent, they had the right to come in or leave uh, the Confederation uh, as they saw fit. Uh, and the other thing about uh, Buchanan, he, by that time, he was just, the, the radicals in North were just, they were ready to lynch the man. He was fearful of his life. Uh, Jefferson Davis went to meet with him. Several other people went to meet with him. And they said, this is not the same president that we swore into office. Uh, he was literally watching out the window expecting a lynch mob at any time because the radicals didn't like Buchanan's notion. Now, Buchanan sort of tried to play, have it both ways. He said, you know, a state can't leave the union, but there's nothing in the Constitution that says that the federal government can force them to stay, you know. And he was trying to play both hands because outside his window was a lot of people that wanted to string him up. Uh, the, he was he was in fear of his life, and that's as soon as uh, he, he was glad to get out of Washington when he did. Lincoln, on the other hand, he belonged to the... Uh, the imperialist faction, as I uh, call it in, in my books, they're, they're, they're wanting an empire. Now, this isn't new. Alexander Hamilton wanted an empire, a commercial empire, and uh, he was a great advocate of empire. Matter of fact, uh, he was such a strong imperialist that Thomas Jefferson called him a... Uh, He's a he's a monarchist bottomed on corruption. I mean, <laughs> Jefferson uh, Thomas Jefferson had no use for Alexander Hamilton because Hamilton wanted a big, strong central government, and all of the Federalists. Now that's back then they were Federalists and and the uh, anti-Federalists. Anti yeah. But uh, <clears throat> the Federalists they wanted a strong federal government, and the interesting thing is that Alexander uh, Hamilton came to the Constitutional Convention with a plan for a strong central government that absolutely mirrors what we have today. Uh, and it was rejected out of hand. Reje it rejected somebody that, that embarrassed Hamilton, and he left and didn't come back till it was almost over. Uh, but there was a lot. Uh, even James Madison, his Virginia plan was very similar uh, so Madison started out as a strong Federalist, and then he sort of saw the light. Uh, he said, no, this, this isn't going to work out. But uh, very interesting in the change in that Lincoln adopted that more of a Whiggish uh, attitude, a high Federalist, Whiggish attitude. We want a strong commercial empire where the center, center government can hold authority and command the states. 
And this is something that our founding fathers rejected out of hand. As a matter of fact, they, they were so upset it almost caused a disruption of the Constitutional Convention. And uh, Benjamin Franklin, of all people, had to call for a prayer and silence to try to settle everybody down so we can get back to trying to create a more perfect union. Now, uh, Lincoln didn't declare ending slavery as an initial goal of the war, but preserving the Union. Why was that? Why couldn't, I mean, why couldn't he just say, okay, guys, we're going to, you know, they've, uh, they've seceded. Now we're just going to end slavery. We're going to take them back over and end slavery all at once. But that's, that's not what he declared initially, his intent. It was about preserving the Union. Why was that if, if uh, you know, the North was so virtuous on the issue of stopping slavery? Well, First of all, uh, Lincoln, again, his main aim was to, to create and preserve an empire. Uh, and, and that's what they ended up with, an, an empire. That's what we have today. People get upset with the Kennedys when we talk about that. But I'm sorry, that's what we have today. We have a huge worldwide commercial empire. Uh, and it's run out of Washington, D.C. and New York and other centers uh, around the world, globalists now. But Lincoln wanted to preserve that, or uh, create and preserve that empire. Now, the the people around him originally, the news. When you read the newspaper headlines at the time of secession, you'll see that the newspapers were generally in favor. If the South wants to go, let them go. You know, uh, we believe in Thomas Jefferson that that the states has the right to leave if it wants to be to leave. That and then all of a sudden they started counting. Now. Uh, a Yankee, if he's nothing else, he, he's a merchant, and he knows how to count. He knows how to profit and loss. He knows he is excellent at that point. And they started counting up, what will we lose? And uh, uh, we quote this in uh, The South Was Right. Uh, one of the newspapers said, uh, you know, they had originally been in favor of letting the South go, and then they said, uh, we were confused until our pockets were touched. No, we must not let the South go. Wow. I mean, that tells you why they didn't want the South to go. It had nothing to do with ending slavery. Matter of fact, they were quite fearful that if you ended slavery, the North would be flooded by all these freed slaves coming up into their lily white states. Uh, it's as you've already pointed out, there were states such as Illinois and Indiana, Ohio, that had exclusion laws that wouldn't allow free blacks into their states. Uh, it's really a, a, a really amazing thing when you look at it. But again, who writes the history? Yep. The people that win. Now, if the invader, the aggressor wins, he's going to paint his opponent as evil people that needed to be exterminated, people, if not literally, and listen, Sherman, Sheridan, Grant, they all actually said these people need to be exterminated. I mean, they, they were not, uh, they, they, they were not friendly towards the Southern soldier or the civilian population. Yeah, that's the point. If they couldn't of exterminate them, at least exterminate their political power and that's what they did right yeah and, and i want to stress that it was not okay we've got to kill all the soldiers it was directed towards the population towards the civilians uh, and and they were very clear about that and, and lincoln knew what was going on it's not yep. like he didn't know what was going on um so there was something else i wanted to ask you about the the stated goal initially well, I, I, that's another thing. I doubt from everything I've read that had Lincoln said, okay, boys, the, the South has gone overboard now. They seceded. We're just going to go down there and end slavery. Uh, let, let's go. I don't think he'd have been able to raise, he might have been able to raise a couple brigades in New England. But I don't think most of the people in the North would have signed up for going down South and ending slavery if that would have been okay. the initial call. Right, and the, the proof of that is that when he issued the Emancipation Proclamation, there was a large-scale uh, upset in the Army because uh, many of them said, we're not fighting for the N-words, you know. Right. Uh, we're fighting for union, you know. Uh, uh, and uh, there was a lot of soldiers that went AWOL because of that uh, Emancipation Proclamation, which, in case you're 
audience are not aware of it. The Emancipation Proclamation issued by Abraham Lincoln did not free a single slave. It declared free slaves in states that were currently in what he called rebellion. <laughs> so he was hoping for a slave uprising. Right. But then it's left as if this proclamation had not been issued for those states in the Union where slavery was still acceptable, right. illegal, and in those areas where the Union Army had occupied. For instance, the six parishes south of me here uh, were all occupied by uh, Beast Butler and the Union Army, and they were specifically excluded, as well as the par our counties in Western Virginia, West Virginia, they were excluded. And oh, by the way, do you know what president was the last president to bring a slave state into the Union? Why, that would be Lincoln with West Virginia. That would be Lincoln when he brought West Virginia in as a slave state. So, you know, this idea that uh, these honorable, gracious, bleeding heart northerners were fighting to end slavery, that's 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 hokum. Right. That's, that, that's, the, uh, that's false history, well, fake and, history. And I'm from West Virginia. My family is from West Virginia. Oh. Uh, and, hey, you know, bottom line is our state was formed illegally. Okay, because the Constitution says you can't make one state out of another without the approval of both states. Well, Lincoln decided to ignore that and allow our state during the middle of the Civil War. Now, at one, on, on one side of his mouth, he is saying that uh, the seceded states, in this case Virginia, you know, they're in rebellion, but they are, they're not in their proper relation. And saying that you can't secede while he is blessing off on a state being created out of another state, not in accordance with the Constitution. So I, I just, that's, that's some serious hypocrisy right there. So apparently secession is not an issue as long as it goes the way you want it to go. Bingo. Bingo. Yeah. Uh, that's when uh, Theodore Roosevelt went down to uh, Columbia when he wanted to dig the canal at, at, across the province of Panama. And uh, the government of Colombia said, no, we're not going to let you do it. We, we're afraid once you get here, you'll take everything. Well, uh, Theodore Roosevelt and the federal government engineered a secession of the province of, of, of Panama from Colombia so they could dig the Panama Canal. Yeah, secession is great when we want it. Uh, that's, that's the attitude uh, that the federal government has had. Uh, now, West Virginia... Uh, my book on uh, Reconstruction, I have a chapter on every state that went through Reconstruction, and it is a, it was appalling to me because I found out, when you're doing research, you find out things, you, oh my God, I didn't know that. <clears throat> West Virginia went through its own Reconstruction. It was treated just like any other Southern state, even though it never seceded. I mean, unbelievable hypocrisy of the Yankee Empire. Well, and here's another thing. Growing up there, um, we were always taught that, you know, West Virginia was formed during the Civil War and that, that most of the troops in West Virginia fought for the Union. That's not true. It was about an even split. Now, my family's from the southern part, the coal fields, poorest part of the state. Um, in the county that my mom and dad are from, and I've traced back my roots, we, were, we had family on both sides there during the Civil War. And... Um, the, the county had maybe 15, 1,800 people in it at that time. There was not, forget slaves, there weren't even any blacks in the county until about 1910, 1920. But the secession vote for when, when they were still part of Virginia, the secession vote was almost unanimous in that county. And, and then the next county, the counties over kind of vary. Some of them are lopsided four. Others are very close to the county where I went to high school at. I think the difference was like four or five votes. Wow. Uh, and and wow. I never knew a lot of this growing up. A lot of these things I found out after the fact. But that, there's been some serious hypocrisy on that issue. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think we already talked about the first goal of the first proposed 13th Amendment was to make slavery permanent. Uh, kind of undercuts the, the, uh, the idea that the North was all about stopping slavery. Uh, we, we talked about this a few minutes ago. I want to go into it a little bit more. The, the conduct of many senior un op, Union officers during the war towards civilian noncombatants. Listen, uh, the war crimes committed against 
Southerners is, is so uh, outlandish and unbelievable, yet you don't hear about it. Uh, and sh- where it's Sheridan or Sherman, uh, it, it does our grant. Uh, all the way down to the lower rank, uh, and and they were all carrying out what Lincoln called his vigorous war policy. And by vigorous war policy, that means you make war on everything that's southern. If if the as Sherman said, if they don't come over supporting us, then they are considered in rebellion and they are uh, uh, legitimate targets. Uh, this is something that uh, goes against all the principles of Christian moral warfare. You don't make war on civilians. Uh, Now, civilians get in the crossfire sometimes. That's understandable. But there was a plan uh, across the South through the Union Army to create massive starvation across the South. Uh, When they go in, they would not only uh, burn the houses, homes down, they would also burn the barns. Now, a lot of People aren't agriculturalists now. They don't understand this. But in the barn is where you keep all your seed. That's where you keep all your implements. That's where your horses and mules, because they usually steal the horses and mules, but all your cattle. So all of that was destroyed. In northeast Louisiana, I have uh, the the record of of one colonel who sent back to Grant. He said, I have destroyed all means of agriculture in this district. Uh, so what do you do then? You, you have massive uh, starvation. And at the end of the war in 1865, there were over 500 Southern civilians in Mississippi, Alabama, and uh, Georgia that were literally on the verge of starvation. And many of them starved to death. Many of them died from diseases due to their weakened, uh, malnourished uh, condition. Uh, it got so bad that Jefferson Davis, toward the end of the war, had recommend eating rats as a means of sustaining life. Uh, so this, the idea that uh, of extermination, and Sherman used the word extermination so often that it became almost absurd when you read and see how often he's talking about exterminating. But Sheraton did, Grant did, all the underlings did. Uh, well, I won't say all of them, but many of them did. Uh, uh, see, there was one uh, fellow, I can't remember his name off the top of my head. He was in Missouri and a close friend of Lincoln. He said, this is a war of extermination. So, I mean, it, it, and Lincoln knew it. Uh, and when the man was reprimanded, Lincoln said, leave him alone. He's a good soldier. You know, so Lincoln knew it. The The administration knew it. Uh, the the Congress, the United States Congress knew it, but this was a war effort to exterminate the South, literally, if at all possible, but certainly politically to exterminate us. Now, in that extermination, it just wasn't white Southerners. And that's that's the thing that, that gets you. It wasn't just the white Southerners that were being exterminated. Far more blacks died than, than, than whites because at least the whites had some means of production. But once the plantation system was destroyed, there was nothing. Uh, in the Red River campaign, uh, one of the Yankee generals came down, and the Red River's in uh, Louisiana, Texas border area, came down. He had started off as he was coming through down into the bayou area of Louisiana. He had over 5,000 freed slaves. Well, the idea was he's going to bring them back and put them to work on uh, uh, government plantations. Well, when he got down to the the South Louisiana, he only had about uh, 1,500 to 2,000 slaves left. They didn't go back home. They died. Wow. Uh, According to a, a northern We'd call him social worker now. He was an abolitionist and a social worker during the war. He said at least 50 percent of the black population of Mississippi has died as a result of this war. I mean, it's unbelievable. But you don't see that in your history books. Why? Because the victor, the invader, writes a history in order to mask over, to hide his crimes and to make the invaded people 
look as if they were evil, deserving to be exterminated, much like Hitler did toward the Jews. You know, they're, they're, they're horrible. They're rats. They need to be destroyed. So that justifies anything you do to them. And a lot of what, we, what we're talking about uh, is confirmed by some of the officers and some of the enlisted in the Union Army that saw this and didn't agree with it, you know, tried to report it uh, or wrote home about it. Uh, so this is not just uh, stuff that was reported by Southerners. A lot of this is confirmed by other Union soldiers and officers that, that brought the issue up. Yeah, as a matter of fact, in the South was right, we quote uh, from the official records of the War of the Rebellion, which is the collection of all the papers uh, from the uh, Army officers during the war. So this is a federal document, and you'll see quote after quote uh, of, of, of where people are being killed, destroyed, black women raped by unbelievable number of, of rapes and, and murders. Uh, it got so bad in South Carolina that uh, blacks after the war and even during the war would not go out in public without a white person to go with them. And the reason is, if it were just blacks and they were killed, no one would believe, you know, the Yankees authorities wouldn't believe them. So they, so if they had a white person with them, there was a chance that, that the white officers would believe the white Southerner that, yes, uh, this horrible thing was done to this black lady. Unbelievable what a, what an invading army will do with and without the knowledge of the officer corps. Right. And the Yankee officer corps was lacking. Let's just put it like that. It was lacking. Right. Uh, Reconstruction is another topic that a few seem to know the full story about. Even the first black senator, a Republican senator, Hiram Revels of Mississippi, right. complained about the federal government slash Republican corruption and policies. And uh, I'm sure you probably know a little bit about that, being from Mississippi and being an expert oh, yeah. on this. Well, Hiram Revels is really, he took the, uh, the seat that President Davis had uh, prior to the war in the U.S. Senate. And, of course, the, the radical Republicans, they just rejoiced over that. Boy, this is just great, you know, in your face to the people in Mississippi. But uh, Hiram Revels was a very honorable man. And I talk about this in my book on Reconstruction, and, and maybe we'll get a chance uh, one day to talk about that. It's not out yet. It won't be out till probably around... June or July, but uh, I talked about the fact that how there was a great potential of good, honest, really intelligent black leaders cooperating with the white leaders to create a really good, fair, equitable Southern society. But that was not in the interest of the radical Republicans because they knew that you know, there's this close relation between blacks and whites in the South. And if they start working together, they'll start voting together. And if they start <laughs> voting together, guess what happens to us? You know, the Republicans, we're a lot, we lose power. So, at, so they set up this system of divide and rule. And Harem Rebels, in his letter, when he resigned from the Republican Party, you don't hear that too often, but he was aggravated with the way the Republicans were treating the South. And he said the harshness that, that, that happened as a result of this war, the evil that's happened because of the conflict between the, the, the races in the South could have been alleviated had it not been for, and he pointed out to the Republican Party and the uh, radicals uh, in Congress. Uh, and, and this, it's a shame because there's just a tremendous opportunity that was discarded. Now, most people think, well, the Southerners wouldn't have worked with Those white Southerners wouldn't have worked with them. I don't know about that. We've been working with them 300 years. But why wouldn't we work with them? Uh, General Beauregard set, was the first advocate of voting rights for blacks in Louisiana after the war. Beauregard saw the need to, to this, this, uh, get them educated, let's get them registered to vote. Uh, once they see that if we work together, we can come out of this poverty and be a, a self-sufficient society. That was General Beauregard. But guess what? Wade Hampton in uh, South Carolina did the same thing, virtually the same thing. But the thing that really gets the uh, Northerners is that 
General Nathan Bedford Forrest said the same thing. He met with blacks after the war, and he said, you do as I do. You go, you register, and you vote for the best man. And he even said that though we are different in, in color of skin, we shouldn't be different in attitudes towards government. We want a good government. And if anyone dares to, to object to your voting, you come talk to me. I'll be your friend. I'll protect you. I'll stand with you. And this was Nathan Bedford Forrest, a man that they claim, mm -hmm. falsely claim, was the head of the Klan. Uh, that's another story. We can't get into that right now. But this this was, and by the way, Nathan Bedford Forrest was a, uh, a slave trader uh, prior to the war. You know, he had slave pens where he slept. Slaves would actually come to uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest and say, would you take, you know, my master is dying. Would you buy me? And I know you'll take care of the people that you have under your control. And yes, they would. And when war came, guess what? He took about 40 of his best slaves, armed them, and took them to war with him. And they actually stayed with him during the war. Then, about halfway through the war, he told him, look, I was going to give you your freedom when we won this war. I don't know if we're going to be able to do it now to win the war, but I will give you your freedom now. You're a free people. You can go back home. You can go over to the Yankee side. Or if you want to, you can stay in the Army with me. All but one stayed in the Army with Nathan Bedford Forrest and fought with him for him until the end. Wow. And the one that left, by the way, he didn't go over to the Yankee side. He went back home to Memphis. <laughs> Yeah, that's one guy that gets a, a totally bad rap on a lot of things, and, and it's disgraceful that in our state capital we had a bust of uh, a forest, and our our lame governor and others, uh, you know, basically moved him off. Of course, the whole situation there in Memphis with his his statue having to be—that's just—it's just flat out disgraceful. And you know, another thing too, if if there was all, you know, they always want to associate uh, the situation with, with Fort Pillow. They always want to blame him for that situation. But people forget they had congressional testimony, a congressional S, uh, um, committee interview him, talk to him, bring him in. If they had anything on Forrest, they would have hung him. And they wanted to terribly, but they couldn't find anything on him. Right. Uh, it, it's... Uh, the, the, the one that should be hung is the uh, Yankee uh, gunboat uh, captain that promised the fort that you, if y'all get in trouble with Forrest, I'll stay here with my guns and I, I'll protect you. But when they saw Forrest winning, they just sailed off and left him. And all those guys, mostly blacks, went running down to the edge of the, the river to find the boat gone. And as they were traveling down, there were Confederates on both sides of the lane and they still had weapons in their hand. Uh, they hadn't surrendered. Uh, their flag never came. They still had weapons in their hand. They were retreating to the river. And that's when the so-called massacre occurred because just great firing going crop. I mean, you're doing on both sides, you know, they yeah. were killing them right and left. And uh, as soon as uh, Forrest got there, he had his lieutenant cut the flag down off the uh, flagpole from the fort pillar and went down and put a stop to the You know, I'm not a military man. I've, I've never served in the military. I have blood relatives that have, but I understand from just reading history that bloodlust, once you get to fighting and killing in the middle of a war, a battle, that it's hard to all of a sudden stop and think rationally. You're just killing anything that's got a gun, anything that's moving because you're in a life or death situation. And that's really what happened to those soldiers there. Uh, it, it was not a deliberate attempt to exterminate black soldiers. Now, of course, the other thing is those black soldiers had were drunk. Yep, that, that, I that heard was, that too. Uh, but, uh, they, they were, if not drunk, they were really had imbibed quite heavily with the alcoholic beverage, which again shows the stupidity of the Yankee officer corps. Yeah, you definitely don't, you don't want people, uh, you know, drinking out in a situation like that. Um, one, or, one other thing that I wanted to hit 
you know, some of the issues surrounding, this has been during Reconstruction as well, surrounding the legitimacy of the way the 14th Amendment was passed. I mean, everybody has heard of the 14th Amendment. Uh, I think it's been bastardized, but, um, I, you know, I've seen, read some things. You have to wonder if, if it was legitimately ratified. Can you talk about that a little bit? We, we have, a, I believe, a chapter and a couple addendums in the South was right about that. And the, the bottom line is it was not legitimately ratified. Uh, it was enacted as opposed to the constitutional term ratified. It was enacted at the point of bayonets. So if, uh, suppose uh, I come into your house and I put a gun to your head and says, I'm going to rape your wife or I'm going to kill you. And your wife says, oh, no, 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 don't kill him. You know, so is that a legitimate act on my part? No, I have a gun to your head. You don't have a free choice. Right. You know? And that's what happened to the South. We originally rejected the 14th Amendment, and it didn't pass. Well, the radicals knew they had to pass this amendment. If they, if they didn't pass this amendment, they couldn't take control of the South. They needed to control the South to keep those uh, uh, 11 to 15 new representatives to make sure they were Republican and not Democrat. So uh, that's why they pushed it, and they pushed it through at the point of bayonets in the South. Now, the interesting thing is, once the southern uh, northern states, somebody said, I believe it was New Jersey and Oregon and one other so, uh, northern state, they rescinded their ratification when they saw how it was enacted in the South, how it was forced upon the South after the South had originally rejected it. But nonetheless, the uh, Secretary of uh, State said it is enacted. It is not a legitimate part of the Constitution. The problem is that that constitutional amendment turn the, the Constitution upside down. Up until that time, the Constitution protected we, the people of the sovereign states, from aggressive federal powers. Right. But once you pass the 14th and 15th Amendment, what you've said is now we apply all the constitutional protections under the, uh, in the Constitution against the state and the Supreme Court and the federal government can enforce it against the state. In other words, the state has no defense. Uh, and and that's, that, that was the death knell of states' rights. I, I hear people even today talk about states' rights, this, states' rights, that. We don't have states' rights. We have state privileges. We are allowed to do certain things as long as the federal government agrees with it. But if the federal government doesn't agree with it, then you can't do it. But that's not a right. That's a privilege. Big difference. And it's turned the United States from a republic of sovereign states, a constitutional republic of sovereign states, into an empire controlled by elites in Washington. Well, I, I'm going to disagree with you a little bit because the uh, passage of the 14th did not repeal the 9th or 10th, and it didn't necessarily make all of Article 1, Section 8. Uh, it didn't necessarily do away with all those limitations, the fact that those are the only delegated powers. Now, it certainly changed the equation, but I, I, I think I'm a firm believer in nullification, let's put it that way, and, and I think we have to push for it as much as possible. I do agree it turned that whole thing on its head to some degree. I don't think that it means that we can't nullify. I don't think it means that we can't push back. And, um, you know, we have used the 10th Amendment with some success. Uh, I think more than anything, more than the 14th, I think the 16th is what has put us at the biggest disadvantage because the federal government's able to, to bribe our states with so well, much. Yeah, let me clarify that. On the 14th Amendment, it wasn't initially thought to be what it turned out to. It was the subsequent Supreme Court interpretations right. of the 14th Amendment. Yes. And no, sir, I'm sorry, you don't have a 10th Amendment. You have a 10th Amendment rights. You have 10th Amendment privileges. There's a big difference. Originally, the state, through nullification, had the right to prevent the federal government. Now, 
what we should do. We shouldn't give up. We should be nullifying. The state should be null. Tennessee, if she doesn't like uh, the, something the federal government is doing, should nullify it. Take it to the Supreme Court. Well, the Supreme Court should not be, and Thomas Jefferson made it very clear, the Supreme Court is not the final authority. Go back and read the uh, yep. 1798 uh, uh, result, Virginia and Kentucky resolves, that the final arbiter of rights under the Constitution is the sovereign state. Now, the 14th and 15th, 16th and 17th amendments, all of those amendments destroyed the original intent of our founding fathers. The, True. But believe it or not, the, the Bill of Rights people like to talk about did not apply to the states. It applied to the federal government. Right. right. All right. The, Supreme, the, the Constitution is a document that limits the power. It explains what the federal government can do, and it limits its power. Now, the states still have the right. For instance, the you know the freedom of religion. You know, the federal government cannot tax the people and give the money to a, to a church. It's it's unconstitutional. But guess what? Up until about 1830, there was a number of, of New England states with, that had an official yep. state religion. Yep. Why now? Why did that happen? That's happened because. The the thirteen the uh, Bill of Rights do not apply to the states prior to the Fourteenth Amendment uh, and the subsequent Supreme Court interpretation of the Fourteenth Amendment. Right, and I, I I think earlier I said that the Fourteenth I believe has been bastardized and 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 it was the Supreme Court that's done that. <laughs> right. But you know right. that goes back to what you said. They're not the final arbiter. The people and the states are. But you know there's a lot of uh, a lot of ignorance out there and not a whole lot of spine, but I really think the only way if we have a chance for our country to get turned around is for the states to push back and, and you know, nullify unconstitutional actions, whether it's, whether it's a court decision, whether it's a federal law, whether it's federal regulation, executive order. I, I think that's, the, uh, I think that's the, the best option we have at this point. So last question for you. What is your goal in releasing an updated version of this book? Well, I, I really want to see the, the people to understand what we've lost, what the South, I want Southerners to understand what we lost, what, why we were fighting, and the ramifications, the, the ill effect of the loss of that war the war for Southern independence, and the fact that the war is not over. It's going on right now. And uh, as Vice President Alexander uh, Stevens said uh, after the end of the war, he said, the cause of the South is now the cause of all America. Uh, it's the cause of all. Because Now, what? what is it? Was he talking about slavery? No, no. he's talking about constitutional republic, a the, the constitution. Now, I want, and I suggest, and the South was right, and in many other books that we've written, that we should be working towards a constitutional amendment. We should have ballot initiatives in every state saying we want a constitutional amendment presented to the people of the states that acknowledges the right of nullification and secession. Now, just the fact that if you can get those on the ballot and start getting votes it direct, even if you don't win, the, the vote, you're starting to show the, the, the left that, look, there's pushback coming. We better back off. You know, Quebec has voted for independence like, I think, three times, and they've never won. But Quebec is respected by the central government uh, of Canada. Why? Because they don't want to get those Quebecois people mad because next time the vote, they might vote to secede. So my point is that nullification and secession, you don't have to do either one of them. You just have to look like you're going to do it and be willing to do it if you have to, if your bluff is called. But, uh, you know, nullification, and I know we're running out of time, but nullification was used by the North. The last su really successful nullification was in 1859 when Wisconsin nullified the Fugitive Slave Act. Yep. You know, they nullified part of the Constitution. And there wasn't anybody uh, calling for troops to come up and march through Wisconsin <laughs> and make Wisconsin howl. No, no, this was a understood right of 
the people of the sovereign state. So we need to get back to that where we can control the federal government. Today, the federal con government controls us, but we can get back if we work together systematic. And that's why I, I write these books. That's why my brother and I write these books. Yeah. Well, I'm definitely, uh, I'm a hundred percent supporter of nullification. And, you know, I think if we do nullification right, you won't have to do secession. And I also exactly. think if you can't get people to do nullification, uh, you, you'd never be able to get secession. Uh, but I, but I'm, I do support nullification. I think that is the only way we restore our constitution. Uh, and, and we're certainly not following the constitution right now. And, and, you know, a lot of people, conservatives will tell you that they don't believe in a living constitution. Well, if you believe the Supreme Court's the final word on everything, you believe in a living constitution. Because wait a few years and it'll change. Right. Uh, well, hey, I really appreciate you being on, especially short notice. You filled in for your brother because of uh, his, you know, because of some bad weather in his area, and uh, I appreciate it. Great having you on. I look forward to reading your your book on Reconstruction, and and thank you for being with us. I want to thank everybody for taking the time to watch our program. Be sure to hit the like and subscribe buttons, as well as the no notification. I almost almost said nullification bell bell, but uh, notification bell to stay informed about our upcoming shows. As a reminder, you can now listen to us as a podcast on Spreaker.com. You can find all the audio-only podcasts of your favorite episodes on our website, tninformer.com, or do a search for the Tennessee Informer on Spreaker.com. Tennessee Informer is also available to listen to on iHeartRadio, Spotify, and other popular podcast platforms. Please take a moment to check out and follow our Facebook page at TN Informer. We'll be posting news and information about upcoming shows on there, as well as on our website, tninformer.com, where you can sign up for a weekly newsletter. We're also on Twitter as well, now at .twitter.com slash tninformer. Share us with your friends. Tomorrow, Wednesday evening, we'll present a special edition Nashville Legislation Update show about the seven Rhino Tennessee State Senators that refused to even hear a bill that was designed to protect Tennessee citizens from woke and rogue FBI agents. We'll present the names and numbers and you can contact them to convey your dissatisfaction. Be sure to come back tomorrow night and take note that we have another special two episode week lined up for you as well. On Monday the 15th of April, we'll have a mystery guest to discuss some important concerns that existed at the Covenant School well before the shooting and murders took place last year. And then on Tuesday the 16th, we'll have Robert Spencer, author of The Sumter Gamut and director of Jihad Watch to talk about how the left is trying to foment and provoke the next civil war. You don't want to miss that one. Hope you'll join us. That's it for now. And good night from Paris, Tennessee, that is. <laughs>